Without hesitation or ambiguity, and fully mindful of such paleontological wonders as large dinosaurs and African ape men, I state that the invertebrates of the Burgess Shale, found high in the Canadian Rockies in Yoho National Park, on the eastern border of British Columbia, are the world's most important animal fossils. This is one of the first paragraphs of the first chapter of Stephen Jay Gould's prose, titled Wonderful Life, The Burgess Shale and the Nature of History. The title is a reference to Frank Capra's It's a Wonderful Life, in which a man contemplating suicide on Christmas Eve is shown by his guardian angel what life would have been like if he'd never been born. I didn't have time to get some stylish underwear. Wife gave me this on my last birthday. <laughs> I passed away in it. Oh, Tom Sawyer's drying out, too. You should read the new book Mark Twain's writing now. How did you happen to fall in? I didn't fall in. I jumped in to save George. You what? You're... To save me? Well, I did, didn't I? You didn't go through with it, did you? Go through with what? Suicide. Stephen Gold chose to reference this plot in his book because one of the main themes in his prose is contingency. The absence of necessity, the fact of being so without having to be so. He proposes that life, as we know it today, is only here by luck, and not inevitability. And that if one were to replay the tape of history, then the end result would almost certainly be very different. But before we discuss these themes, we need background on the story, as Stephen Gould gave in the first few chapters of his book. We need to know what the Burgess Shale is. It's the 30th of October, 1909. Deep in the Canadian Rockies of Yoho National Park, through Burgess Pass and up the side of a mountain, a man named Charles Walcott discovered a layer of shale that would change our understanding of history, even if he didn't consider it at the time. An old paleontological in-joke proclaims that mammalian evolution is a tale told by teeth mating to produce slightly altered descendant teeth. Since enamel is far more durable than ordinary bone, teeth may prevail when all else has succumbed to the whips and scorns of geological time. The majority of fossil mammals are only known by their teeth. As Gould says here, fossilization is a rare, miraculous thing. Sometimes scientists get lucky and find a bone. You may think that bones are relatively common. But consider that when we only know a species by a single fragment of a single bone, this fragment is all we know of an entire species that had lived for millions of years. The problem is only some animals have bones. In 1978, Scoff analyzed the potential for fossilization of average modern marine fauna of an intertidal zone. He concluded that only 40% of genera could appear in the fossil record. Animals that are only or mostly comprised of soft tissue, like flesh, skin, or organs, are rarely fossilized. This makes the Burgess Shale a gold mine of discovery. It is comprised of fossils that date back to 508 million years ago, a few million years after an event known as the Cambrian Explosion. Previous to this event, life was very scarce. Even fewer of those organisms were large enough to see with the naked eye. And then, at the end of the Ediacaran, 541 million years ago, life flourished. Suddenly, on a geological scale, life became diverse. Almost all major animal groups appeared, and it lasted for millions of years. We don't know why this happened, and one of the few real windows into what happened is the Burgess Shale. Most animals at the time were only beginning to grow hard parts, and most organisms were soft and tiny. And, through chance and luck, circumstances allowed these soft-bodied organisms to be preserved for hundreds of millions of years. This is the Burgess Shale. Back in 
Back then, the Burgess Shale was at the bottom of a giant, nearly vertical wall called the Cathedral Escarpment. Further up the escarpment was a diverse reef environment, where all kinds of strange animals lived. Today, we can classify all species of arthropods into four distinct groups. In the Burgess Shale alone, we know of at least 20 different groups of arthropods, many, if not most, with no modern relatives, and with anatomies unseen since the dawn of life. This should provide insight into how strange and diverse it was. Among them, animals like Hallucigenia, the odd relative of velvet worms, which has been historically reconstructed upside down, backwards, and with its head on the wrong end. The name was given to honor its baffling appearance. Wuwaxia, the totally unclassifiable invertebrate covered with scale-like plates. As it got older, two rows of these plates developed sticking out of its back. It is one rare example of Burgess Shale animals being preserved through different stages of life. Morella, the most common arthropod in the Burgess Shale, even though it is one of those animals which require their own unique category of arthropods. It has no modern relatives. These are only a few examples of the oddities of the Burgess Shale. To quote Stephen Gold, remarking on the researchers who went on a mission to properly study and describe all of these Burgess Shale biota, at first, you jump up and down. After a while, the richness benumbs you. By the time he found Odontogryphus, he could only say to himself, Oh, f Another new phylum. So, how were these animals possibly preserved? This question has caused much debate, and there is no firm answer. In Stephen Gold's wonderful life, he says that the force responsible for this impeccable preservation is a Lagostatin an anoxic lake bed where no bacteria, animals, or any other agent of decay can reach the corpse, and where fine silt covers the body and preserves it in high definition for eternity. This kind of lake bed is responsible for the feathered fossils of the Ishan, or the organs seen in Scipionix. However, in recent times, this form of preservation being the reason behind Burgess preservation has been called into question. Modern theories include a brine seep, giving nutrients to the reef while making the sea floor so high in salinity that nothing would want to scavenge there. Another topic up to debate is the cause of the Cambrian explosion itself. One theory posits that before the Ferenozoic, life had a hard time due to a lack of oxygen. Then, at the end of the Ediacaran, the oceans became much more oxygenated, and life quickly adapted into numerous swarms to take advantage of the oxygen. For this wonderful bestiary, we can thank the efforts of four major players. First, Charles Walcott, and then, decades later, Harry Whittington and his colleagues Derek Briggs and Simon Morris. Walcott was the person who first discovered the Burgess Shale. As a storytelling animal, we humans have a tendency to embellish their tales. Take, for example, the modern myth of the discovery of the Burgess Shale, taken from Walcott's obituary. One of the most striking of Walcott's faunal discoveries came at the end of the field season of 1909, when Miss Walcott's horse slid on going down the trail and turned up a slab that at once attracted her husband's attention. Here was a great treasure, wholly strange crustacea of middle Cambrian time. But where in the mountain was the mother rock from which the slab had come from? Snow was even then falling, and the solving of the riddle had to be left to another season. But next year, the Walcotts were back again on Mount Wapta, and eventually, the slab was traced to a layer of shale later called the Burgess Shale, 3,000 feet above the town of Field. Despite this nice little story, Walcott's own journals tell of a much more ordinary tale. By August 31st, the day after it was discovered, he and his family were already well on their way collecting Burgess Shale fossils of Morella and Waptia. 
one of the unclassifiable arthropods. When Walcott found Morella, he gave it the nickname Lace Crab. Its scientific name Morella came from a friend of his named Mar. Most organisms of the Burgess Shale are named after locations and mountain peaks such as Mount Wapta and Waptia. However, as Walcott discovered the bountiful animals of the Burgess Shale, he made a grave error consistently with each new discovery. He was very traditional, and it would never cross his mind that perhaps these animals didn't fit into his preconceived ideas of life. With each new discovery, one after another, he always shoehorned the life of the Burgess Shale into previously defined phyla. Arthropods like insects, and annelids like earthworms were the two most prominent groupings. After Walcott's death in 1927, all of his findings, notes, and journals, which he kept extensively, were placed into storage, and forgotten about until a group of scientists revisited them. Enter stage left, Harry Whittington, Derek Briggs, and Simon Morris. While these scientists did do wonders for all Burgess fauna, I'm going to focus on one example, to illustrate what they did, how they did it, and why they did it. Possibly the most famous and popular of all Burgess fauna, Anomalocaris. I could not have made up a better story to illustrate the power and extent of the Burgess revision than the actual chronicle of Anomalocaris. A tale of humor, error, struggle, frustration, and more error, culminating in an extraordinary resolution that brought together bits and pieces of three phyla in a single reconstructed creature, the largest and fiercest of Cambrian organisms. Anomalocaris had actually been discovered before the advent of the Burgess Shale, and this is reflected in its name. Anomalo comes from the Greek word for unlike or anomalous, and charis is from the Latin word for shrimp. This name does not describe the entire animal, instead it was the first name applied to the first part of Anomalocaris discovered. The first part was a feeding appendage, which Joseph White Eaves, thought was a strange shrimp-like organism, due to its resemblance to the tail end of modern lobsters. Then, when Walcott was excavating the Burgess Shale, he came across a mouth part. He believed it was a new animal, a precursor to jellyfish, and so he named it Peitoya. Then, Walcott found another feeding appendage, which was assigned to the pre-existing animal genus Sydnia, and lastly, the body itself which was classified as a sponge named Lagania. During the re-examination of the Burgess fauna by Whittington and crew, Anomalocaris was one of their later rediscoveries. When they found pieces of it in the cabinets where Walcott's finds lay, they were at a loss. Firstly, Conway Morris took a look at Lagania, using his favorite method, a microdrill. He found out long ago that the Burgess fossils weren't flat impressions, but very squished 3D fossils. He could cut away layers to look inside the animal. When he performed this operation on Lagania, he uncovered a fossil of Peitoya attached to what he believed to be a sponge, Lagania. Unfortunately, he concluded that the two fossils were still distinct animals that simply happened to fall upon each other post-mortem by accident. But even in his error, he had found a link between two parts of what would be Anomalocaris. Later, Simon Briggs would help to raise doubts over the theory that Peitoya was an Adarian. For one, no jellyfish has ever had a hole in the center, as seen in Peitoya. Conway Morris noted this fact, writing that the feature is unseen in any living or extinct Nadarian. Simon Briggs made up for his mistake in his redescription of Anomalocaris, the feeding appendage believed to be its own arthropod. He claimed that Anomalocaris was not a complete organism, as no specimen showed signs of a gut. Instead, he believed it to be a kind of walking leg of a giant arthropod, more than three feet long. He believed that the second kind of feeding appendage, previously thought to be of Sydnia, was probably from the same animal as Anomalocaris, and thus the other two parts of Anomalocaris were joined as one. Though his redescription was wrong on most counts, with Anomalocaris not being a walking leg. The redescription would help significantly. Even Briggs himself doubted his conclusion. Almost all Burgess Shale fossils were completely articulated, full organisms, not bits and pieces. So why could they not find the body of what was presumably the largest animal of its time? Well, the truth was, they already had. 
under the name Lagania. The Geological Survey of Canada expedition had discovered an odd specimen in the Raymond Quarry just above Walcott's phylopod bed. Whittington had taken this large, ill-defined, and virtually featureless fossil and placed it in a drawer, hoping, I think, to bury it by the old cliché. Out of sight, out of mind. But he kept thinking about this peculiar fossil of a creature so much larger than anything else in the Burgess Shale. I used to open the drawer and then close it, Harry explained to me. One day, in 1981, he decided to excavate the fossil in the hope that some details of structure might be resolved. He dug into one end of the creature and, to his astonishment, found a specimen of Anomalocaris apparently attached and in place. Harry told Derek Briggs about his discovery, and Derek simply couldn't believe it. The excavated object was surely Anomalocaris, but like Simon's interpretation of the jellyfish Peitoya on the sponge Lagania, perhaps this specimen of Anomalocaris had accidentally been entangled with a large sheet of something else, as the mudslide coalesced. And then, after finding a connection between Lagania, Peitoya, and Anomalocaris, they had a breakthrough. I should clarify that Stephen Jay Gould is not a fan of having breakthroughs be the key moments of scientific stories, as he believes that they are far and few between, and often the real progress is made without a breakthrough. But in this case, he made an exception, because this was a truly momentous moment in the Burgess Shale history. While working on a collection of large, featureless blobs from the Burgess Shale, like the blob on which they'd found Peitoya and Lagania together, they dug through one fossil to find what they'd been waiting for. They discovered Lagania with an Anomalocaris attached to it as an organ, and then beside it a fossil of Peitoya, similarly attached to the main body of Lagania. The connection was made. Anomalocaris was known to be the limb of another animal, and they just found the body. Anomalocaris was finally in one piece. Due to the complicated rules of taxonomy, the mechanism for naming and classifying organisms, the name Anomalocaris stuck, because it was the first name created for the animal that would eventually join with Peitoya and Lagania. Later discoveries would solidify their connection, and one specimen even included the eyes of Anomalocaris. Two giant compound eyes, with 16,000 lenses in each. They were the most powerful eyes of their time, and would only ever be rivaled by that of the modern dragonfly. As for the second feeding appendage, Appendage F, believed to have come from Sydnia, was actually the feeding appendage of another species of Anomalocarid, with much more pronounced prongs. These appendages were used in roughly the same way for both species, passing food inward toward the jawless mouth once called Peitoya. They would pick up animals from the seafloor, crush them, and deliver them to the mouth. Anomalocaris had odd fin-like organs, which undulated, allowing Anomalocaris to propel itself. The motion of these organs was shown to be naturally stable, so Anomalocaris would not have needed a complex brain to move. Others will finish this generation's run at the British Shale, and then the next generation will arrive with new ideas and new techniques. But science is culminative. Despite all its backings and forethings and ups and downs, the work of Briggs, Conway, Morris, and Whittington will be honored for its elegance and for the power of its transforming ideas, as long as we maintain that most precious of human continuities, an unbroken skein of intellectual genealogy. And so, finally, I believe we are now ready to talk about the themes of the book. Namely, the second part of the subtitle to his book, The Nature of History.
The Burgess Shale includes a range of disparity in anatomical designs never again equaled and not matched today by all the creatures in all the world's oceans. The history of multicellular life has been dominated by decimation of a large initial stock, quickly generated in the Cambrian Explosion. The story of the last 500 million years has featured restriction, followed by proliferation within a few stereotype designs. Not general expansion of range and increase in complexity as our favorite iconography, the cone of increasing diversity implies. Moreover, the new iconography of rapid establishment and later decimation dominates all scales, and seems to have the generality of a fractal pattern. To first explain the theme of contingency, imagine yourself in the Burgess Shale, 500 million years ago. You have to pick out which animals will succeed in modern times, and which ones will falter and fade away before animals ever reached land. You see a reef of animals, most tiny, some odd worm-like animals not longer than your finger, grazing on sponges. On the silt, a strange creature with spines on its back slowly traverses the seafloor, using tentacles to pick out a detritus, kind of like the machine that the cat in the hat used to clean the house, and moving it to its face. The seabed is swarmed with an elegant-looking arthropod, the most successful organism in the Burgess. Swimming above, a two-foot giant undulates its way through the ocean, picking up the rare few trilobites off the seabed with giant pincers. Closer to the seafloor, preying in smaller animals, a creature with five eyes and a long tube ending with a mouth-like pincer grabs animals and lifts them into its mouth. And swimming around, with only a few in sight, strange animals that look like a lamprey with a tiny mouth. In contrast, an armored creature unlike any other plays the role that sea slugs do today. Out of all these animals, I guarantee that if you were put in that scenario, you wouldn't have picked out the sponge-eating worm as an ancestor of modern insects, or the tiny, fleshy, swimming animal with no real means of defense as an ancestor to every animal with a spine. Why not Morella, the most common animal around, or Anomalocaris, the largest and most dominant predator that life had yet seen? Perhaps this example doesn't work. Maybe it's simply too far in the past, too alien to really imagine. Let's try a modern example. One happening right now. Humans. The Earth was going through an ice age, and was dominated by the megafauna. Animals like mammoths, giant ground sloths, and American lions ruled. And then, some really smart primates showed up on the evolutionary scene. They wiped out the North American tigers. The mammoths, the ground sloths, and almost all of the other famous ice age animals. Now we've created a new threat. Global warming. It doesn't kill off the least successful, nor did humans. Who would have guessed that the smartest, most dominant vertebrate on the planet, humans, could one day cause their own extinction whilst animals like the octopus or humble jellyfish thrive in this new Anthropocene climate? It isn't predictable. Despite all you've heard, and despite all the iconography showing you the evolutionary cone of progress and increasing diversity, on a grand scale, it's not survival of the fittest. Something often ignored by the general public when it comes to the topic of evolution is that there are multiple mechanisms that drive it. The primary one that most people recognize is called natural selection, where only the strongest and most adaptable survive, and the organisms which cannot survive or simply cannot compete with other organisms perish. But another key role in the history of evolution is proposed in this book, something Gold calls the different rules model. The Burgess Decimation may have been a true lottery, not the predictable outcome of a war between the United States and Grenada, or a World Series pitting the 1927 New York Yankees against the Hoboken Hasbins. If one were to play back the tape of life, something similar to the modern collection of life may not occur, even if you were to replay the tape a thousand times over. This is an uncomfortable truth and everyone who is aware of this concept knows it. It's always been hard for humans to admit that we aren't all that special in the universe, even with our big brains. But with contingency in mind, it's amazing to us that, of all possible outcomes, we have made it this far. Finally, if you will accept my argument that contingency is not only resolvable and important, but also fascinating in a special sort of way, 
then the Burgess not only reverses our general ideas about the source of patterns, it also fills us with a new kind of amazement, also a freeze-on for the improbability of the event, at the fact that humans ever evolved at all. We came this close, put your thumb about a millimeter away from your index finger, thousands and thousands of times, to erasure by the veering of history down another sensible channel. Replay the tape a million times from the Burgess beginning, and I doubt that anything like Homo sapiens would ever evolve again. It is indeed a wonderful life. One creature has been consistently left for the end. Saving the best for last, Gold calls it. It was the last animal to be studied by Sam and Briggs, and the last animal mentioned in Wonderful Life. And I too have left it till the end. It's Pekaya, and it was left for the last because many think of it as the most important in this story of contingency. It was first classified as a polychaete worm, an annelid, but Whittington discovered it was one of the most primitive known examples of a chordate. In the time that Gold wrote his book, it was the first known chordate, though more primitive examples have been found recently. A chordate is an animal with a notochord, a long cartilage structure that eventually becomes part of the backbone in later animals. All vertebrates are chordates. And while Pacaya was not the first, nor the only chordate of its time, it represents the design used by the first chordates. The ancestors of every vertebrate to have ever lived, from the first fish, to the sharks, to giant temnos bundles, to dimetrodon, to dinosaurs, to horses, to dogs and cats, to chimpanzees, and to humans. If Pacaya and its chordate relatives went extinct, none of us would exist. Pacaya and fellow Cambrian chordates were rare, and possessed no advantage over any other animal of the Burgess Shale. The odds were even stacked against them. But the reason all vertebrates exist is only because those first tiny chordates survived, and for no known reason. It survived not because it was the strongest, or smartest, or fastest, it merely survived. And we, the animals with a spine, are its legacy. I'm Prehistorica. Thanks for watching. a cloud in the sky, Mr. Cupid just winked his eye, and you walked by, it's a wonderful life, I have more than my share, see me walking around on air, because you care.